Yeah, I have a day word for today, and the day word is uh, Luke 18. For those who don't know about day words, that's where you go and sit, maybe in December or even now in a season like this, and you ask God a word for every day for the next 365 days. Now in December, you go and sit for two days and you write 365 sentences and 365 scriptures. It's like these uh, books that you find, you know, Dachstikis, what's that in English? I don't know. You know, devo daily devotional. But it's just you hear from the Holy Spirit about your life, specifically what you need to know. And what I wrote in December for today is this uh, chapter 18 in Luke. And I believe, you know, when you look at a scripture, <coughs> read Luke 18 for a hundred times, and each one, each time, God will say something different to you from a unique angle. Because the depth and the richness of the knowledge of God is, you cannot capture it, you cannot, it cannot end. They will know, there will not be no boring day in heaven. Because for eternity we will still stand amazed at the beauty of our God. There will always be something fresh. I don't know how it's going to work, but I just know there will always be something that we say, wow. That's going to be amazing. Amen. Yeah, amen. And even now, as Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they will may know you, the Father, and the one that you have sent, Jesus Christ. Let's experience something about eternity, something about eternal life by coming to know him in such a real way, not in a religious way, because that's from a demon of religion, <coughs> but from a place of relationship. Amen? Are we with one another? So I'm going to give you a few points, definitely seven, from um, Luke 18. If you go with me, if you go with me, your stature in life. My brother and my sister, at the end of the day, you have no stature except in Christ. There's people that have stature, and they give themselves stature, let's say, somebody that's an excellent, excellent businessman. But in the center of that is maybe greed, or in the center is pride, or in the center is the fear of lack. So many people that I've met that made millions. But from an inner vow that my children will not suffer like I suffered. Anybody know of people like that? And actually, their stature is not with a success with one billion dollars. But their stature is in fear of lack. Stature in, I'm trying to become somebody so that I will be a somebody and not a nobody. But there's a place where I must find myself in Christ because I must lay down my life. My life is crucified with Christ. I've died with Christ. I've been buried with Christ. I've been raised with Christ. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, but there's a life for me. And the word says that life is hidden in Christ. You go to heaven. You received Christ as your Lord and Savior. You go to heaven. But there's a life, a quality life that God has for you here on earth. And that life is hidden in Christ, the word says. And for you to come to know that life that is hidden of God's dream for your life, that what he has for you for tomorrow, the good works that he has prepared for you, what he dreamed about, the excitement that he has about your future, all of that you will find in a place where God, not in a cheap way, is just throwing it out for you. But you need to seek him. You need to seek him because he's a jealous God. He wants your love. He wants you to be the, be come to him and not for the goodies, but for him. And then in him, you will find the life that he has for you. <coughs> now Christ in you and you in Christ. Oh, we said that a hundred times, but let's say it again. When you received God, you invited him in, and that is Christ in you. And that is like, okay, Christ in me. But then John said, more of you, less of me. Because there's me and my personality and my fears and my anxiety or my what and my success or my what I have. But he said, more of you, less of me. So 
Christ in me and more if it's Christ seeing less of me, Christ seeing less of me, Christ. And this side it is me in Christ. When I mature, when I've grown, there's more of Christ in me. And this place is where is a life hidden in Christ that must be revealed. Uh, are you with me? Some of you, you look like Okay. You are with me. So you receive the kingdom. You receive the kingdom, the word says. But for you to inherit the kingdom, you receive the kingdom as a seed. But to inherit the kingdom is you enter the kingdom. So that's where it's not just the authority of God, authority of the king in here. That I'm walking into a life, into a place where all around me is his authority that will have the final say. That's me walking into the kingdom. But for that you need to enter as a child. But you're talking about your stature in life. Now, when you, when you look at all of this, we, in this Luke 18, he talks about the parable of the persistent widow, the parable of the Pharisee, tax collector, the little children and Jesus, the rich and the kingdom of God. Hello, Jesus predicts his death and a blind beggar receives his sight. A lot of stories, a lot of excellent principles. But sometimes God just wants to put things together for you. So um, I challenge you. I give you one of hundreds ways that God going to reveal to you what he wants to say maybe in this passage. We're going to go. We're talking about your statue. First one, if you can write down, statue in the world. Intimidating people. Who experienced in your life some intimidating people? Mm, not necessarily your mother-in-law, but intimidating people there could be. Now, when there's intimidating people, even when you were a child, and this 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 teacher is intimidating, you know? Or well, that guy's like a bully and he tells you, you're a rubbish man, you will never get anywhere in your life. And, and for some reason you took it in your heart. And I will never get anywhere in my life. And now I'm building to prove that I will get somewhere in my life. And my stature is in that word. From that intimidating person and you can be successful you have no stature in that success your stature is that you took that word off that intimidation so first of all nothing in the world nothing in your flesh is supposed to intimidate you but your own fear can intimidate you as a worldly king because this whole story is about it says here in a certain town there was a, a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. He just walked over them. If you take all the translations, basically summed up. He just walked over them. So he says, this guy, no respect for God, no respect for people, just do whatever he wants. And now one that is the lowest class in those days, a widow, is... He, she is the whole time there with him. And he, she's looking for trouble. She's playing with her life. But you know, <coughs> that, that king that has no respect for God, no respect for people, could be in your life. And that king's name is your flesh. Your flesh has no respect for God. Doesn't care about you or people. And you can allow that flesh, that fear, that intimidation, that rejection, that hurt, that overreaction, that religion, that pointing of the finger, that, that fight that you have with people. You can allow that flesh that actually is your enemy and the enemy of people. You can allow that to intimidate you, intimidate you. And you think you are protecting yourself, deceived, because it's just this flesh intimidating you. For that, what is in you, and for people that is around you, <coughs> you're supposed to understand how to have a persistence, persistent, persistent prayer life of faith. <sighs> faith as a center point. I need faith. 
And faith you can get from the word. Faith is a gift from God. Why is it a gift? Because the word is a gift. And from the word, when you read the word, you eat the word, you meditate the word, it produces faith. But it's a gift because the word is a gift. Uh, are you with me? Hello? So in that place, <coughs> he says in the beginning, he, told, he spoke to them about this parable so that they should always pray and not give up. Everybody say, I will not give up. But why will you not give up in the Lord? Because you will pray. I'm not talking about a guy out there emotionally telling people with an excellent speech, motivate them to not give up. You as a child of God, if you don't want to give up, pray. You don't pray, you're going to feel sometimes really, really, really to give up. But if you want to understand how to become strong, not to give up, where that becomes a principle for life, that is just in you that you will not give up. It's not part of your personality. It's not a choice that you made. It's something established in you, and that is through prayer. Always pray and not give up as a result of always praying. Persistent prayer. So these, this lady, she I don't know what English word is there for karang. No word. Okay, all right. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, keeps bothering me, even if a, if a widow will go to a worldly king and karang and bother him and bother him and bother him, how much more if you come to God in a persistent way, your heavenly father that is perfect, will he come and fight the battle for you? How much more? That is what God is saying. So come on, guys, you understand your stature in the world is from a place of prayer. Are you with me? If you come with this in the stature of prayer in the world, from that place, Jesus went up the mountain and we prayed. And every time he came with stature, Moses went up the mountain and when he came down, he came with some stature. Hello. Are you with me? Hell came and tempted Jesus on the mountain that he refused and he came down with stature. Your stature in the world is based on your prayer life and how persistent you are in your prayer. Not prayer in fear, not prayer in crisis. The fear, the crisis, the in honesty lay down before the Lord. But you better get prayer through the word. Amen. Are you with me? You have it. Persistent prayer life of faith. That's number one. Number two, stature in the world. Okay. Stature in the church. Just do it in love. Religious people, proud, arrogant. Oh, man. <coughs> Who've been disappointed, hurt by religious people? No. I think everybody here. Why? You won't believe it because they were human. They're not Jesus. I know we expect everybody else to be perfect except ourselves. Maybe me, not you. But what shall I say? Oh man, there's so many people back out there in the world. And because of hurts, the enemy is laughing at them and say, We got him. We got him. He's, when somebody hurt you, you think you're protecting yourself. Meanwhile, you are just hurting yourself more and more and more. Take away from you the awesome, beautiful life that you could have had if you can forgive, but not just forgive, forget through the blood of Christ by thinking more about what God is saying about people. The more you think about the word, the more you stay with the word, the more you forget that because it's becoming less important. That what is less important you forget. Why you for, uh, never forget the, the disappointment? And the, because it's important for you to remember. You decide it's important to remember what that person did to you, or what that leader did, or what those guys did. You decide because it's important. But if the word is more important, 
and you start to focus more here and you start to meditate more here and and the voice of the word is so loud and you cannot hear exactly the voice of that thing of that hurt or that bitterness or that fear or that hurt because the voice is so loud in you the voice of the word we need that and that is stature in the church that you need because otherwise you're going to hear voices of broken people hurt people people that just know how to hurt others because they just hurt themselves people feeling totally hello are, are you with me so there's healthy people in the church but is it not is it not the prodigals that must come in that messed up everything the guys that made a mess up of their lives that still has a lot of mindsets where there's a lot of rubbish that prodigal son he came back he just repented but all his mindset had still to be changed are you with me they were the fattened calf and they were the feast and everything <coughs> but it was not clickety click and all the mindsets and all everything changed <sighs> but if we can make room for one another if you sow grace, you understand grace. If you sow forgiveness, because in the way that you forgive, God will forgive you. That's freaky, that prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we also forgive. And some of the translations, in the way that we also forgive. Hey, may God help you, may God help me. But if my hand is like this, I keep this against you. How can my hand be open to receive from God if my hand is like this? Because I have something against you or against you or against you. And the only one that is being beaten up is you beating up yourself. Let it go. Let it go so that God can fill you with his grace and his beauty. Amen. Okay. What are we talking about? So religious people but you need humble honest prayer life in brokenness we are talking about what we're talking about the parable of the pharisee and the tax collector pharisee and tax collector the, uh, the pharisee says god i thank you that i'm not like these other people robbers evildoers adulterers blah, 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 blah. thank you lord i'm not like emil no 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 i mean like um <laughs> you're not like one of them I mean, um what's the crap you were okay so what am i saying and then the guy the other guy he said god have mercy on me i'm a sinner god have mercy on me i'm a sinner and the one is the religious guy and he's just full of pride and arrogance a lot of rubbish the other one <coughs> with humble honest prayer a humble honest prayer life in brokenness my brother so first of all it must become a lifestyle in the first point persistent prayer as a lifestyle with faith but secondly the way that i come because sometimes i don't just mess up man i don't know if you experience that you cannot believe that you messed up you cannot believe what you said it's like i can think somebody else will say that not me <laughs> hello but <coughs> honest prayer honest before the Lord and with humility humility that will protect you humility that will make that you will not feel ashamed that you are not condemned you are not condemned but if you don't humble yourself you will be humiliated by your flesh and with hell and with the world but if you don't want to be be shamed in and be humiliated come with humility and brokenness before God you are in that hut, you are in that hole of whatever, negativity, depression, or whatever you're going through. Don't try to climb out. In that depression or in that whatever, just turn over in a place of humility. And if you humble yourself, God will love you up. He will take you from that place. Amen. Are you with me? Humble, honest prayer. God, I'm a sinner. <coughs> Have mercy on me. Mercy means practical help. Mercy has to do with God's practical help. Grace is God's enablement. God enables you. Amazing enablement that I can be a child of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 
that saved the wretch. God's enablement that did it. Grace, God's enablement. Let's say grace, God's enablement. Mercy, God's practical help. Have mercy on me, please, Lord, practical, in a practical way. Come and help me. I need you. Amen. So that we need, so that you have stature in the church, not in the world, stature in the church, not because you are doing all the goodies so perfect. No, but you come with honest hum humility, honest, humble prayer in brokenness. Right, next one. Number three. Stature in adulthood. We're talking about adults, sincere, childlike expectation and faith to enter. To enter what? To enter the kingdom. Okay, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're supposed to enter the kingdom as a child. Enter the kingdom as a child. We're talking about the third point. That is where all the kids came to Jesus and the adults said, the in Afrikaans we say the groot mense of die volwassenes. I don't know what groot mense and volwassenes in English is. The adults and the, the big people. <laughs> Grown ups. Okay. So people can grow up but not become mature. Adult is supposed to be mature. Uh, grown up, if I can play with the words like that. Some people they grow up but they never mature. They never become an adult. When you grow older, you can stand in yourself, but then you become childish. But when you mature, you become childlike. And with childlike faith, you can enter the kingdom. Now, what are we talking about? <coughs> the children, they receive the kingdom. When you gave your life to Christ, you received the kingdom. But you know, I can receive a house, but never enter the house. They can have the Canaan as an inheritance, but never possess the land. Because having this life that you can have in Christ, you cannot enter into that life if you don't come with childlike faith. If you don't come with childlike faith. So you can grow up and think you are an adult. But an adult, a mature adult, is more dependent on God than the little kind, little kid. We, we say, okay, when you're a child, you, you are dependent. And I understand, we all understand what it means. And when you're grown up, you're old enough to make your own decisions. Yes. But actually, according to the word, if you grow up and you mature, you realize you don't want to make any decision without God. And that is when you enter the kingdom. That's a different way. But if I grow up, and now I'm just wanting to make my own decision because I'm an adult, that's childish. Let us become childlike. Amen. You received the kingdom when you became a child. If you grow in maturity and you become more dependent on God, you will enter the place where his authority is all over you. We ease authorities all over you when you, so that when you enter the job, the authority of God, of God is over you. When you open your mouth in the meeting at the, at the job, the authority of God is there. Because you know how to be a child before the Lord. Sometimes we so grow up that we forget how to be child before the Lord. We need to learn how to be a child before the Lord. A child sincere sincere childlike expectation and faith to enter the child that is not reasoning and i must understand everything before i will do and i trust god to understand so that i can hear his heart now that's two different things you can hear his heart and you don't have to understand the little child he jumps because the father said jumped daddy said jump Dave, that's why i jump hello I'm not trying to make sure about the distance and this and his hand stretch out his this is are you with me sincere there's something about innocence to be innocent in that <coughs> so make sure that in you the child the child you as a child of God that it will be a place of of a simplicity in your faith with God. A simplicity. Don't let it become so complicated to be a Christian. 
but let there be some simplicity of here's this child walking with his dad that's beauty that's beautiful that's beautiful in your walk with god please man okay if you don't become like so it's not just going to automatically be there jesus said if you don't become like because the disciples told the children Shh, be quiet they rebuked the children so this properness in you this adulthood in you can say Shh, to the child in you and you have such a lot of decisions in your responsibilities to make that all this decision making and all this responsibility in your job and who you are tell the child in you Shh, don't do that okay but you as a child go to the father and the father wants to bless you father wants to bless you amen all right number four seven points okay stature in provision <coughs> rich people so the next whole part is all about this rich man coming to jesus is what must I do to be saved? He said, you must keep all these commandments. Uh, the rich man said, yeah, oh, I'm faithful. I am keeping all these commandments. I'm doing all of that. Jesus looked at him and said, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything. Huh. One thing. That's everything. Go and sell everything. Give it to the poor and then follow me. <coughs> Yo, Lord. Can we not just at least walk a road with a man? He, he, he's faithful in 95%. Why you nail him on the 5% that he's done wrong? Who felt sometimes like that when somebody speaks to you and think, why would he nail me or why would she nail me on this one thing that I do wrong? Because he's a God of love that wants you to succeed, to excel, to go to the next level with him, with him, with him. Amen. So the thing that is becoming your security, he wants to talk about that. That one thing was the thing that was his, the guy's security. And the man walked away. And when he walked away, and the disciples saw that, they said, Yo, Lord, yo, if that is how it is, how, who can be saved? Peter said, the disciples said, Who on earth can be saved? Gets, who can be saved? And then Jesus said, with man is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. But remember, we use this in the context of a lot of things in our lives, and it's good. But the main context of that scripture is in the context about riches. Greed, the root of all evil, covetousness, the root of all evil. And you know, to be greedy or to be a, to covet geld um, gierig, it's not just when you have a lot of money, but if you have a mindset that's just like the rich man. And the mindset is, when one day I have this, then I can do that. When I have that, I can do that. When I have that, I can do that. And with that mindset, you cannot be saved from the rubbish today. You still go to heaven but you cannot be saved from that what the world is worth just throw and vomit on you you'll get stuck there no man that's not the life that god has for me and you come on come on let's get rid of that <coughs> because with god all things are possible that is our word. You will not get stuck. I will not get stuck. We will not get stuck in finances, in the fear of lack, in the thing of only when I have that, then I can. I will not get into that mindset because with God, all things are possible. God can save me from that, Rabbi, from that mindset. How many of you then become negative, frustrated because you don't have finances for this, you don't have that? Start to praise God as a trick so that everything changes. No. Start to praise God because of contentment. Contentment is I'm satisfied with what I have. But in that place of being satisfied with what I have, you find guys, they didn't give over to the Lord, they gave up. And they sit in depression or they sit in negativity. And uh, they just there. 
There's a difference. There's a difference. The one that can protect me when I say I have contentment, I'm satisfied with what I have. I sit back, I'm satisfied with what that I have. So you have no faith for more. You have no faith for any other breakthrough because you're just satisfied, satisfied with what you have and you're just going to cut and cut and carry on like this till you die. No, that's not what contentment is all about. It's a certain attitude, but he's married with thankfulness, with gratitude. So contentment has to do with, I'm thankful for what I have. I'm pushing for more. I'm pushing for breakthrough. I'm pushing for that, what God has for me still. Not because I'm ungrateful. So this contentment has to do with, I'm grateful towards God for what I have. No moaning, no groaning. They moaned in the desert and then God said, what, you, what were you talking about? I will do what you said. I said we go in. You said no. We are brought out here to, so that we can die in the desert and they moaned and they groaned. And God came down and said, we will do what you said. And so for 40 years they walked until everybody died of that generation. So God can come and do what you say if I keep moaning, moaning, groaning, and groaning and about what I'm going through. And God will stand back. He will not forsake you. He will be with you. And you will go to him. You will go to heaven. But for what he has for you here on earth, you cannot inherit it. Because it's for free, but it's not cheap. God is not a cheap God. And he will not give you something cheap, something fake. You are still here? Good. Where are we now? These people dependent with faithful heart and godly gratitude. <coughs> because in all of that faithful heart, oh man, be dependent on him. You know, this lady, and she's praying for 20 years for this, and she doesn't see the break. God provides for her. God provides for certain things. And then you find this knoll, this guy from the world, you know. And he gave his life to Christ. And he prayed for something. One month later, he just received this major thing. This is unfair. That old lady prayed for 20 years. But to understand one another in the right way, not to be jealous in God's provision. But don't look at the riches of the man out there. The one that sat with riches... But it was in a, in a wrong way. It was on fear. It was with cheating. God's hand is not on that. There's a curse on that. That must be broken in the name of Christ. Because that, that billion rand, for that child to inherit, there's a curse on that billion rand. The hand of God is not on that billion rand. You must make sure that what you make... That God's hand is on that. So that if you give it to your children or to somebody, that is going with the hand of God on it. Because you made it to the honor of God. And you receive it with gratitude and humility. Amen. You're still here. <coughs> right, let's carry on. A stature in your family. Family and expectations. Kingdom priorities in family relationships. What are we talking about? Okay, this is the next point where Peter, <coughs> where he said, no, oh, Jesus, okay, everything is possible with God. We, have, we, we don't have, I mean, that guy must go and sell everything yet. We left everything. We left our houses. We left our families. We left everything behind, our jobs, to follow you. And Jesus said, there's nobody that has left everything for the sake of, of the kingdom that will inherit now but will also inherit more in the eternal life than what I have for them that must, doesn't mean you must get rid of all the family if you want to go to heaven that's not at all what it means it's talking about the priority in your life the priority in your life that my first of all my heart is not to keep my husband happy or my wife happy or my children happy I must raise them in the ways of God, but the focus must be Christ. Christ as the priority in my, in my relationships. Christ is the priority, priority in everything. <coughs> because in the family, 
Man, oh man, that's the place where we can see one another in the flesh. A prophet is not honored, honored in his own land. Why? Because they, the only place they said, that is not the son of God. That is the son of Joseph in Nazareth. That's the only place everybody said, that is not the son of God. That's the son of Joseph. We look in a natural way. The natural does not receive the things of God. So it can be so dangerous as Christians, as a, as a church, as a families, when we just see one another in the flesh. Because we see one another's mistakes. You grow closer to another child of God. Ay, ay, ay. Be prepared. Because when you see, the enemy is hoping that you will identify the wrong. So that with the pointing of the finger, he can curse you. Because when you judge, you will be judged. Are you with me? Who saw that in your family? You know? I can stand here, but please don't go and speak to my family because they will know about some mistakes in my life that you don't know about. Hmm. Are you with me? <coughs> so with each one of us, because we are all human, that doesn't mean we can do what we want. That doesn't mean we must be fake. Are you with me? Sometimes I said to my children, I'm not standing here because I have breakthrough in all the areas. Many times I'm standing here to declare and I pray Saturday or even when we pray as a family and say, God help us and God help me what I must say that we will live it. That we will get the breakthrough in it because it's that we declare what we want to live in the name of Christ. Amen? Are you with me? Ah, please, man. Okay, so, <coughs> but in the context of family, if you want to have stature, in your family, you better know respect and honor. The culture of respect and honor. We can easily slander, curse one another with our words. Ay, 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 God must help us. But you know, God says, honor your father and your mother. Not because they are right, but because God said so. That is a key in the only ten, uh, one of the Ten Commandments if you want to see your future. There's a promise in that commandment. If you honor, you will inherit. Canaan. If you honor, if you can understand that in spite of mistakes, you respect them, you can go in because it's not because you do everything right that you are into Canaan. So if you can give grace to your parents, grace to the leaders, grace to your brother and your sister, you will understand that it's only by grace that you can end Canaan. Are you with me? So may God help you. May God help you that we understand family context. <coughs> when he say, bind us together, and sometimes he's grind us together, Lord. <laughs> it feels like that. But all I'm saying with that, <sighs> God's going to help you, God's going to help me. Amen. But you honor and you'll be surprised in what God will do. In what God will do. All right, that was number five, number six. We're going for a landing. Stature in your understanding of life. Oh. Okay, misunderstandings among people, commitment in faith without understanding. What are we talking about? Hey man, <laughs> how many wars because of misunderstandings? Even go and look in the history of uh, Hiroshima and uh, Kawasaki. What was the other place where the atom bomb? <laughs> Something like that. The thing is, that one is a bomb and the other one you burr with. Hey. Nobody knows about that, it seems to me. But you understand what I'm saying. And what misunderstanding of wording happened, actually, before the time. Guys, yo, even so senseless, this war between Russia, Ukraine, and how many billions and billions and billions of dollars are thrown in there so that people are just blasted away into pieces and oh, I don't know what we want to say further. And then it's, and then 500 people died on this side and 400 on that side. Nearly a thousand died when we went one kilometer further in this counteroffensive, in this war. Pathetic. But how many times in a in a fight, there's no winner. 
Between you and your wife, there's no winner. You and your brother, your sister, your parents, your children, there's no winner. The Jews and the Germans, so many stand ashamed. The whites, but he's not white and black because I'm not white and you're not black. Oh, white, you run for your life if I was white. He's only a corpse that is nearly white. Look at that white of that. that. This is white. This is hopefully nearly white. But what? You call it what? Milky bar and, and uh, uh, vanilla and chocolate and caramel. Yeah, that's the three. <laughs> What on earth did I want to say? I don't know. But, um, and it's like the senseless thing of, of apartheid. Ridiculous. The thing of the English and the Bura. There were more racism between the English and the Afrikaner. Oh, what they would do. I mean, the Buddha could say, you know, if, if we took all the Sutu mothers and children and just throw them in a camp to die with rotten water, with whatever sickness, and just throw them there. Whoa. But that's what the English did to the Afrikaner with the concentration camps. I know my grandfather, he had bitterness against the English. And then one generation further, the Afrikaans and the English look at one another and say, what the heck was that for? Pathetic. You know, what did they gain? Now they all make, marry the Afrikaans, marry the English, this, and the Sutu marry the... You are not Sutu. That's a Marry the, what is your Engels? No. <laughs> yeah, and all over. And the, and the Sierra Leone, marry the Sutu. What do you, you call you, you guys in Sierra Leone? Okay, whatever that was. I can't remember. I didn't hear. <laughs> but, ach, man, what am I saying? Like, are you with me? The Eastern, East German and West German with a Berlin Wall, you know? And then, when that thing fell, the intense traumatic crying of family that saw one another 50 years before. And they couldn't see one another, they didn't have contact for, that must be so, must have been so intense, eh? For what? So all the fighting and all the stuffies with one another. For what, man? What do we gain from that? May God help us. Most of it misunderstanding. That the next generation don't think, well, how did they think? What was their type of understanding that they destroyed one another in such a way? But then... The only way that you can bring that curse and destruction in the next generation is by having offense or judgment. If I have judgment when I hear the stories what the English did to the Afrikaners, if there's judgment about what the whiteies did to the Sutus, that's how you draw the curse into your life. Draw that what is from hell into your life so that what you will have you will give yourself that sickness. You will give yourself that thing that you will destroy your own life. And react to life and not have a life in Christ. God's going to help us. Commitment in faith without understanding. Well, this part was <coughs> in the Bible here. Was just, we can just read it and say, And Jesus said to them, we must go to Jerusalem because I will be given over. They will, uh, they will beat me. They will spit me uh, on me. They, it, it says like that. And they will do all these things and then they will crucify me. I, and and uh, I will die. But after three days, I will be raised from the dead. And it says they, they didn't understand. It says verse 34. The disciples did not understand any of this. Any of this. But you know what? Even though they did not understand, they still followed full out.
But sometimes when we don't understand the word, or we don't understand what God is doing, we get disappointed, and we, our walk with God is cooling down. Because I don't understand. And when I understand, yeah, I have faith. My brother, my sister, you need stature, that you will not be shaken when you don't understand it. For this, you need stature. All of this is how you will have stature, so that your house will stand in the midst of the storm. Stature is that you've built accurately your, your house on the rock, the revelation of who God is, so that when the storm comes, the world will see, how, do that, how can that house still stand there? Because it's built on the revelation of the King of Kings, the true creator of everything. And they will have to acknowledge. That is what's going to happen with the church, when the storms and everything in the end time, more and more the world get, will get more crazy and crazy and crazy and crazy. More and more, you see, even with all these stuff is that uh, you can identify as a whatever, man. What? Identify as a dog. You can identify as a the ridiculous. And then this one professor stood up and like in the past 40 years, he, he taught and he said, he taught normal biology. And he was taken and he was fired. Now what the heck must they do? They must just give new textbooks. Then, but the ridiculousness of things are there. But in the midst of all that, the rubbish will be exposed and the church will rise with stature. If, if, if you understand how to build on the word. So that if I understand the word or not, I will read it. I will eat it. I will meditate on it. I don't have a cooking clue what I'm reading. And then you drop it. I've done that few times because I don't understand what I'm reading now just keep on reading because the word in itself is life it's truth that will set you free when you read the word it's truth you just take it in if this thing understands it or not are you with me are you still alive okay commitment in faith without understanding we're going for the last one some would say hallelujah eh? stature in organizing Stature in organizing. Okay. What are we talking about? Proper program people. That is supposed to be in brackets. Proper program people. Desperate seeking of God with specific agenda. What are we talking about? Once again, is this one guy, he's crying out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the proper people with the program say, shh, shh, be silent. They rebuke him. We can be so busy with our programs that the crying out in your spirit, the crying out from your spirit unto the Lord, your soul and your busyness, tell that the crying out in your spirit to say, shh, there's no time, there's no time now. But you don't say it verbally. But how you are so busy with your soul, with your proper programs and everything that must happen, it's just there's no time now. Just to focus on God. And I'm not saying drop everything you do and now you're just spiritual. Not at all. But in that moment, just focus on God. Thank you, God, for who you are, what you do, um, what you say about w what I'm doing now. And God giving you one sentence and there's an adjustment. And suddenly what you would have done in eight hours, you suddenly do in two hours. Because you got God's input. And you had to hear it. And he wanted to give it to you. But will you be open or you are so busy that the one crying out screaming nearly to, desperately for christ you tell him to shh because it's not according to the program now it's not time for the blind and the beggar and, and the lame to be healed now we are on our way and the guys walking with jesus says shh you're walking with jesus but for that part in your life that's maybe crying out to God, you don't even know about it because you are so silencing it because the voices and the crying out of circumstances, crying out of all the other stuff that must happen, I'm so busy, there is no time. So if we even say there's a prayer time or we say there's a the time that we're going to do that or there's a time to be trained, it's immediately out, it's immediately shh. Why? Because there's no time. 
I'm not trying to manipulate you to come and do a course or two or three. But wherever you're involved, if you're here involved, you're supposed to be trained because the word says, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. And then, see, I'm with you in a very practical way. That means, first of all, not I must go and make disciples, baptize them and teach them. That means, first of all, I must be discipled. And I must be baptized by someone, not baptized myself, not disciple myself. Somebody must disciple me, when I'm accountable to. Somebody will baptize me and somebody will teach me, not just me and the Holy Spirit. That is the great commission. So if that is a, the great commission, you better be part of that. Hello? No super spirituality because you got hurt. But I need to have the guts to come closer to people. Even they're going to fail. The one that will disciple you, that will tell you, he's going to have mistakes, man. That's it. And then you, don't wait till you're perfect. You're not, it's not, never going to happen. And, but you need to speak to others also. Even though you think that they can say, oh, but you are struggling with that. I'm in the same boat. I didn't say I'm perfect. I'm saying this is what we're supposed to do. This is an answer that I know. This is how we can get to the other side. Through whatever, through the storm, through whatever. Are you still here? Are you still here? <coughs> Please, don't sh the desperate crying out to God. Desperate seeking of God. Everybody say desperate seeking of God with a specific agenda. You know, when you uh, have that, Jesus is on his way to do something. There's a program. Jesus always has something to do. You won't believe it. But on his way, when he wanted to do that, how many, 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 many miracles happened while he was on his way from here to there? Your life? Is it just one hell of a frustration when your focus is lost because you're on your way to do that and that's supposed to happen now you're just frustrated you're just negative you feel even depressed or whatever because this is what you're supposed to do and now all this other stuff is interrupting maybe from the devil well with jesus it didn't work like that while he was on the way this happened this happened so while he was on the way this happened and that happened so he was too late in the program he was too late he had to be yesterday there so the ladies that are the closest to him mary and martha you are too late jesus doesn't help you are here now lazarus is dead he's already in the grave four days so you are too late oh jesus god is too late for you <laughs> And then, no, 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 we cannot open because it's four days. Lord, do you understand what I'm saying? It is too late. Time-wise, it's too late. The grave is closed. Case closed. Nothing can be done. Time-wise, too late. Oh, man, God wants to rock up in your life and surprise you with many things that is too late according to this thing where it's closed and it's going to be horrific the stench when you open it up nothing too late for your God don't be led by the proper program it's not proper to open the grave it's there's a stench that can gonna come from that corpse it doesn't help you rock up here now Lord with all respect please please Expect a God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can think or pray. Are you with me? <coughs> See God with that what he has for you. Oh, I must just tell you this one. Sorry, this isn't the previous point. My wife said I must tell you about that. We have still a few minutes according to the religious system. Um, okay. You know, your relationship with, with your family must be very good also. Uh, we see one another in Christ. Amen? You have statue in Christ. The one that they always uh, talk about where you must be making sure you have stature is with your clean mother, with your mother-in-law, your school mom. So uh, I had one guy coming to me here in the church. He's not here now. Don't look around. And he, 
He said to me, Pastor, you must pray for me. You know the 10 plagues? Yes. The 11th plague is going to hit me tomorrow. I said, what are you talking about? He said, my mother-in-law is coming. I said, you don't talk like that about your mother-in-law. Yeah. I had to rebuke this man. But in any case, this guy, his family and the mother-in-law, they went to Israel. And uh, in, the pro in, in what happened, it was a time, she was in her 80s or 90s, I don't know. And she died, and the man said, for $100, you can bury her here in the Holy Land. But for $5,000, you can take her back to America. Oh, what would you love to do? What would you like to do? He said, I will pay the $5,000 to take her back to America. He said, it's $100, then you can bury her in the Holy Land. He said, I've heard about a man... He died here, but after three days, he rose from the dead. I cannot take that chance. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is not how your relationship is supposed to be with your mother-in-law. Oh, I just had to say that. Make sure you see one another in the spirit. Amen. Desperate seeking of God specific agenda and I say put that specific agenda out there and the words that you will hear is Jesus stopped and he said what do you want me to do for you wow that's a sentence from God to you but that is a sentence that you will only hear as an opening statement in your conversation with God that day if you come with a desperate focus in spite of flesh, in spite of performance, in spite of program, that you are so desperate for God that you are focusing and you're crying out to Him in your seeking. I'm not talking about throwing a tantrum. But from your spirit, really having a focus, desperately crying out to God, you will meet Him and your God will say in that place, what do you want me to do for you? I bless you with that, and that Holy Spirit will bring that cry in you, will bring that focus in you, will bring that capacity in you and me, that we understand how to have that pure seeking, pure desperate seeking of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you just come, please, and that you touch every man, woman in this place. If you are here and you need to get back to the Lord, just pray with me this prayer. God, here I am. I come back to you, my Lord. I feel ashamed of what I've done wrong. But God, I pray that you will help me feel discouraged. I've tried so many times with so many things. But Lord, here I am. Please take me. I cannot do it, but you can do it in me and through me. Because with you, all things are possible. I come back to you and I thank you, Lord. That through your spirit, you'll guide me in your word and through your word that I understand I am more than a conqueror. Because greater are you who, he, who is in me than he, the one that is in the world. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to fear that I will fall again. I don't have to fear that I will be a failure. Because I'm more than a conqueror in you, Lord. Thank you for that. And I ask this in Jesus' name. God, and I pray for every man, that woman that had to make that decision, that you will bless them, you will guide them. But for all of us, Lord, help us to understand the stature that we're supposed to have in life. Where it's not about personality, Lord. Where it's not about leadership capacity, Lord. But it's about you in the center of everything. Help us to find our lives hidden in you through the Holy Spirit, by your grace and through your word. We trust you for that in Jesus' name. And all say, Amen, Amen. Let it be so.